Hi guys, Matt from Mystery History here. Today I wanted to start a new topic. It's surrounding the very real and unexplained mysteries of the crop circle. Throughout the last several decades, many people have come forward as culprits to these strange occurrences, with many of these events subsequently being proven hoaxes. However, there exists a rare few that do not occur near human settlements, not accessible by road. These crop circles are often witnessed by chance in some of the most remote regions of Earth, whose characteristics have evaded scientific explanations since their arrival on our planet. These particularly special formations will often show traces of things which defy logic. The crops from authentic circles will often grow back and show signs of the traumatic event through mutation several generations down the line. Several crop samples from remote formations discovered in the early 90s in the UK were found to have been coated in a quote, iron glaze, which was later found to be an iron oxide called hematite. Other components present within the samples were later found to have had meteoric origins. After the iron glaze's discovery in 1993, all subsequent unusual crop circles were tested for traces of iron oxides. Many crop and soil samples since then have shared similar characteristics. Tiny metallic magnetic spheres are also often found within soil samples accompanying the formations. When young maize has grown out from a real crop circle's harvest, they have exhibited strange characteristics, such as unusually uniform growth and germination rates. The seed from crop circles that occur on mature plants often exhibit a significant increase in growth rate and vigor, up to five times that of control seeds. When scientists and many other types of professionals have attempted to replicate these crop formations, they have utterly failed. The real formations can stretch many acres and often appear overnight, an impossible task when you realize that each corn stem has been laid in differing directions, somehow manipulated individually. The crops will often show signs of scorching from an extremely high temperature, with traces of plasma found on numerous occasions. The scorching is only ever at the base of the stem, in a small location known as a node. When the crops grow back, these affected nodes usually enlarge by some centimeters. No one has been able to replicate these formations or how they could possibly be created. Whatever is making these circles might not be human after all. If the creators of the crop circles are of extraterrestrial origin, this raises some interesting if somewhat concerning questions. For example, what would be the formation's purpose? How would you communicate with a being from another planet entirely? Maybe this is the question they are attempting to answer. Rising nearly 400 feet above the desert floor in a remote section of New Mexico within ancient Anasazi territory is a place named Chaco Canyon and within stands an imposing natural structure called Fajada Butte. Hidden from the world for over 700 years, along a precarious narrow ledge, there lay a secret, ancient, astronomical observatory. Subsequently given the name Sun Dagger, and the reason why is nothing less than remarkable. It has been revealed that for more than a thousand years, the Sun Dagger has been revealing to all aware of its creation the subtle changing of the seasons. In 1977, it was thankfully rediscovered when rock art and petroglyphs were spotted nearby. Anna Sofer, who was cataloging the rock art, was one morning greeted by the sun dagger, slowly traveling across the wall, traversing the strange spiral patterns which were etched upon them. The intelligent Anna realized that the sun dagger could have been connected to the petroglyphs, so along with her colleagues, she came back at various dates throughout the year eventually establishing the following information. On the summer solstice, the sun dagger appears near the top of the largest spiral, and over a period of 18 minutes it slices through the very center, cutting the spiral in half before leaving it in shadow for another year. On the winter solstice, two daggers of light appear, lasting for 49 minutes, during which they frame the large spiral. Finally, an equally fascinating and more complex light show occurs on the spring and autumn equinoxes. The large spiral is carved in such a way that counting from the center outward to the right, there are nine grooves. On each equinox, a dagger of light appears that cuts through the spiral on different angles. Meanwhile, a second dagger slices through the center of the smaller spiral. These light shows, which had been going on for centuries, continued for several years after their rediscovery. 
However, in 1989, it was found that the granite slabs had shifted. The alignments that had been arranged so carefully were no more. It also seems impossible for us modern people to realign them as all attempts have failed. Was this sun dagger really made by the Anasazi Indians? Or was it a far older surviving relic, one that they were merely aware of? A relic which has unfortunately eroded away? Similar ancient light displays marking the solstices and equinoxes can be found at other locations as well, such as in the southwestern United States and Mexico. In a ruin in Hovenweep National Monument, near the borders of Utah and Colorado, light beams also illuminate spiral petroglyphs on the summer solstice. At Burrow Flats in Southern California, a winter solstice sun points a finger of light to the center of five concentric rings in an early Chumash rock art display. Were these monuments once used by a lost, ancient advanced group of marauders as calendar sites while traveling America? Perhaps one day we will know for sure. The phenomena we are about to cover may at first sound absurd, and indeed it would appear to be impossible. However, due to the vast array of witness testimonies which span the earth, it would be ignorant to not approach the subject with an air of curiosity. The phenomena became known as entombed animal, and throughout the years it has been referenced in the writings of William Newberg, J.G. Wood, Ambrose Paré, Robert Plot, André Marie Constant Dumeril, John Wesley, even Charles Dickens mentioned it in his journal All the Year Round. According to Fortean Times, a British monthly magazine devoted to the anomalous phenomena, about 210 entombed animal cases have been described in Europe, North America, Africa, Australia, and New Zealand since the 15th century. Animals are reportedly found alive after being encased in solid rock, coal, or wood for an indeterminate amount of time. The accounts usually involve frogs or toads, thus the phenomenon is sometimes called toad in the hole. Although it has been dismissed by mainstream science, it remains a topic of interest to the Fortean researchers among others. On rare occasions, multiple animals are said to have been found encased in the same place. Benjamin Franklin wrote an account of four live toads claimed to have been found enclosed in quarried limestone. One Eric G. Mackley claimed to have freed 23 frogs from a single piece of concrete while widening a road in Devonshire, the UK and an 1876 report from South Africa said that 63 small toads were found in the middle of a 16-foot wide tree trunk. Though reports of entombed animals have occurred as recently as the 1980s, during the 1820s, English geologist William Buckland conducted an experiment to see how long a toad could remain alive while encased in stone. He placed toads of different sizes and ages into carved chambers within limestone and sandstone blocks, then buried the blocks in his garden. Buckland concluded that toads could not survive inside rock for extreme lengths of time and determined that reporters of the entombed animal phenomenon were mistaken. In an article in an 1890 Scientific American, a writer declared, quote, Many well-authenticated stories of the finding of live toads and frogs in solid rock are on record. While a few years later the editor of the magazine Nature argued, quote, it matters little to tell the reporters of such occurrences that the thing is absolutely impossible, and that our believing it would involve a conclusion that the whole science of geology, not to mention biology, is a mass of nonsense." End quote. Assuming that out of the hundreds of reports from around the world, some were actually true, then just how did these animals become entombed in stone? And how did they survive? The last official report was in the 1980s, so we may have to wait a while for another occurrence. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. On a number of occasions, we have covered the unexplainable remnants left by a civilization, which once undoubtedly flourished here upon this planet. A true mysterious history. The most notable, and presumably the evidence which will remain upon our Earth for the longest, being the unimaginably enormous megalithic structures which rest in many areas of Earth. These structures built using stones so large, we cannot explain how they were moved. The quarry, known as Yang Shan, is such an impressive example of this lost knowledge and or technique for moving these stones, we felt it deserved an in-depth discussion. What is special about Yang Shan is the fact that it was seemingly abandoned, quite possibly due to cataclysm. In the midst of actually cutting some of the largest stone megaliths ever found on Earth, revealing in all its glory just how these stones were indeed detached from the Earth's bedrock, 
a question which had also remained unanswered for many years. Yang Shan also reveals invaluable clues to how they could have been moved. The star of the show, an enormous steel weighing 16,250 metric tons, disputed to have been cut during the reign of the Yongle Emperor, the third ruler of the Ming Dynasty in China, reigning from 1402 to 1424. However, although academia is seemingly willing to approach such subjects with an air of arrogance, often due to its in-depth, accurate understanding of said era, it inevitably becomes unstuck once one begins to explore their knowledge or indeed explanation of how these enormous stones were intended to be moved. Academia's illogical explanation of the site is as follows. In 1405, the Yongle Emperor ordered the cutting of a giant statue in this quarry, for use in the Ming Zhaoling Mausoleum in dedication of his deceased father. Three separate pieces were being cut, the rectangular base, the body, and the head. After most of the stone cutting work had been done, the architects conveniently realized that moving stones from the quarry to Ming Xiaoling and installing them there would not be physically possible. The body weighed 8,799 tons, and the steel's apparent head weighed 6,118 tons. According to quote, experts, it would have stood 73 meters tall. A supposed legend attached to this possible fallacy has it that workers who failed to produce the daily quota of crushed rock of at least 33 shang would be executed on the spot. But is this the real story of Yang Shan Quarry? Or could there possibly be a more interesting history attached to this site, and indeed its accompanying stones? Within Baalbek, one of the countless examples found around the world there are stones well over a thousand tons in weight, which seem to have been effortlessly placed atop one another, using technologies or methods unexplained by these so-called experts. Is it really that unthinkable to believe that they could indeed once shift these enormous stones found in Yangshan? Not only move them, but lift them on top of one another? Fortunately, more and more people are beginning to look at this exact possibility. And with the mounting evidence in support of far greater antiquity surfacing every day, it is only a matter of time before these sites are truly revealed for what they actually once were. As one would come to realize, while traversing such fields of research as we do, you will inevitably come face to face with a worthy adversary. That foe, of course, is modern paradigm often scoffed at when discussing the possible existence of a highly trained, highly secret group of worldwide individuals who are tasked with the protection of a profitable lie. Often labeled a conspiracy theorist due to the vast array of missing evidence and stolen relics. Yet, alas, regardless of this, we feel it is our duty to vindicate all those who have suffered for doing nothing more than tell the truth. Many thanks to Will Hart over at Nexus Magazine in Spain for his exhaustive research. Let's start with a familiar friend, the Great Sphinx. In 1993, NBC aired a show titled The Mysteries of the Sphinx. During the show, geological evidence was shown which indicated that the Sphinx was vastly older than Egyptologists currently claim. This evidence has subsequently become popularly known as the water erosion controversy. The self-taught Egyptologist John Anthony West first brought the evidence to the attention of geologist Dr. Robert Schock. Now, after thoroughly studying the Sphinx firsthand, numerous geologists share West's conclusions, and many have announced their findings to the world. Dr. Zawi Hawass, along with the Egyptian antiquities, have launched a barrage of public criticism at this new evidence. Renowned Egyptologist Dr. Mark Lehner who is regarded as the world's foremost expert on the Sphinx, also joined this attack, publicly declaring West and Shock as ignorant and insensitive. The smear campaign was ultimately a success and squashed any further exploration of the theory. This, regardless of the overwhelming evidence supporting their claims. And this intellectual mudslinging is unfortunately quite common. The case of author Michael Cremo could be seen as a well-documented example of this, 
and it also exposes just how the scientific establishment openly uses pressure tactics on the media and government to stifle historical truths. In Michael's book, Forbidden Archaeology, he examines many artifacts that prove modern man's antiquity far exceeds the age currently accepted by academia. In 1996, when NBC broadcasted a special program called The Mysterious Origins of Man, they covered material from Cremo's book. The reaction from the scientific community could be seen as verging on ridiculous. NBC was deluged with letters from furious scientists and others within certain fields who all called the producer a fraud and the whole program a hoax, even attempting to force NBC to not rebroadcast the popular program ever again. They went to the tremendous effort of presenting a case to the federal government requesting that the Federal Communications Commission step in and bar NBC from airing the program again. This was not only an apparent infringement of free speech and a blatant attempt to thwart commerce, but up to that point, it was an unprecedented effort to censor intellectual discourse. Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre would also feel the cold hands of conspiracy. A geologist working for the U.S. Geological Survey she was dispatched to an archaeological site in Mexico with the task of dating a group of artifacts. This particular case, again, perfectly illustrates just how far this elusive establishment is willing to go to guard orthodox tenants. McIntyre used state-of-the-art equipment to date the relics, but her results were off the charts. The lead archaeologist expected a date of 25,000 years or less, yet she found dates of 250,000 years or more on multiple occasions. A dating of 25,000 years is conveniently critical to the Bering Strait crossing theory. Once her results were realized, the head archaeologist decided to dispose of Steen McIntyre's results. She has since found it hard to get her papers published, and she has also lost a teaching job at an American university. These sorts of scenarios from these particular types of people is what drives us to expose the truth. No one should lose their career because they are doing it correctly. Unfortunately, however, unless there is a dramatic shift within our own society, stories such as these are likely to continue. If you enjoy our content, if you think our battle worthy, please help us to continue our voyage of discovery in unraveling the mysteries of history. Links to donate can be found within the